Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. However, however, I'm not Richard Skipper. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Richard Skipper Celebrates. I am Celeste Simone, and today we are turning tables, and we'll talk about how that came about in just a bit. This man has made great contributions, not only to the theater world, but to the cabaret world. And he has interviewed everybody and their brother. And a couple of months back, he interviewed me. And I said, Richard, wouldn't it be fun if somebody interviewed you? And he said, sure, let's do it. So here we are. So if you've been here before, um, thank you for coming back. If this is your first time, stick around because I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And please subscribe to Richard's um, YouTube channel. I think I'm not centered. I don't. Okay. Centered. Well, who is centered these days? So <laughs> I'm not. So anyway, <laughs> subscribe and let's get our, our show started by introducing a man that I there are so many words to describe him, but the one word that comes to mind through knowing him, and we're going to talk about that too, because I forget how we met, is positivity and integrity. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Richard Skipper. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. It I, seems, I thank you. I your screen there. Okay. You love my screen? Yeah, well, I like you know, thing in the back. Thank you. It's, it's a curtain and in Sumitsuki, who you know told me about the lights that I put behind it and anything to make it look like a studio. A studio. Well, ho yeah. well hello, Richard Skipper, and happy day before Easter. The when you interviewed me, it was the day before your birthday. Mm -hmm. Is that mm -hmm. right? That's right. So, yep. And so now it's the day before Easter. And, and are we still in Passover? I'm not Jewish, so I don't know. Um, well, I think that whatever people celebrate, that my philosophy is, and anyone who knows me, I think you know this as well, I try to celebrate every day. I try to find you something. Do. Uh, I do. I, I try to find something within each day that can be celebrated. And there is this site called Check a Day, uh, believe it or not. And every day I get the list of all the things that we are celebrating on that particular day. Today's celebration, uh, just to give you one, is called Find a Rainbow. And I'm looking for rainbows every day. So uh, that's just good. part of the fun. And of all it. your posts on social media are always so positive and always so. Not all of them. Not all. <laughs> well, most of them. I'll go no for problem. most of them. Well, you celebrate different people's work. You have had unbelievable guests on, and you've gotten so many. I mean, you have John Davidson, Ruta Lee, Connie Francis, Michael Orland, writers, um, performers. Celeste Simone. Oh, yeah. Musical directors. I mean, you've just had so many wonderful um, people from all areas of the business that you celebrate. And mm -hmm. it's not gossipy, like they like it said in the introduction. It's about how you got from, as you say, point A to point B. That's right. Um, I do want to, I do want to, do you remember how we met? We met at Don't Tell Mama. I saw you perform there and I became an instant fan and I followed you. smart. <laughs> well, of course, I followed you for quite some time. And then um, you uh, disappeared from the cabaret scene in New York. And I guess that you had moved on to other aspects of your life. Uh, you were focusing on other areas. Uh, you became a world-class, first-class teacher and coach. Um, and then I, you know, I've lived here in Rockton County. We both live in uh, Rockton County, you and Nyack, and I'm just below you. Uh, now, in how did you find Piermont? First of all, this is about you, not me. But yes. I just want to tell you one thing. The other day, somebody asked that I, I get some production shots out. So I went to the only cabinet I had not cleaned out during the pandemic. And I found that we worked together in 2000, uh, March 3rd, 8 o'clock p.m., 2001. Wow. 
I lost you. We lost you. The, hold on a second. I don't know what happened. Uh, one second here. Heather, look at you. We, we lost you. We lost you for a second. Do you remember this? Oh, my God. Yes. This was I, 20 years ago. And I and just I, was looking through pictures to send to a project. And I came across this and I went, oh, I must save this. So how we're going to start well, I've got story, I have got a story about that night. And I am going to. If we're the never going to get done. Involved, no. If the person involved uh, is watching, I apologize. The night before, I saw a show on television. And I was talking about how awful I thought it was. Something I don't do anymore. I, if I, because, and this was a lesson learned. I was sitting in the dressing room talking about how much I disliked this show that was on the night before. And one of the actresses that was in that show was in the dressing room with us. And, oh, I, yeah. yes, and I said, I would never, ever, ever do that again. How it bites it, you in the butt, doesn't it? It bit me in the butt. And I am very, very careful. Um, if I don't like something, uh, I, I may share it with my friends in conversation, but I don't post it on Facebook. Um, I don't talk about the things that I don't like. Um, I celebrate the things that I do like. So, uh, especially politics, in this business, because we're so naked, everybody yes. has something to say. So just keep it to yourself. And as I say to people, you have your peeps, you know who you're safe mm -hmm. with. Keep it to well, just before we went live today, I was on Twitter and someone says, uh, you know, I really don't care about the Kardashians. I don't care about who they've married. I don't care about their children or anything. And I responded to the tweet and I said, but you care enough to tweet about them. It's true. We yeah. all got something. As yes. you said, who's centered these days? Certainly not me during this COVID. That's right. But okay, so Richard, so you came from South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Yes. What I want to know, and I thought about this this morning, um, what do I want to know about Richard? I want to know a little bit about when you realized that you loved theater and you were talented. Did your parents <laughs> celebrate your talent? No, no, no. no. So, and they okay. still don't. And they still don't. We all have something. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My oh. father passed away 18 years ago. Um, I don't blame them. Let me start there. Um, I don't blame them. And it took me a lifetime to realize this. Uh, I don't blame them because it is so foreign to them. I left home when I was 18 years old, Celeste. I came to New York on my own. Um, my 79, right? 1979. I managed to save and put aside over the course of several years of working on tobacco farm with my grandparents, working at Grand Strand Amusement Park in Myrtle Beach. Um, I, I would put a little bit of money aside each week. When I was working on the farm, my uncle who I was working for gave me $36 a week. And my parents would let me take um, money because I love going to the movies. We had a movie theater in my hometown and my parents would let me take enough so that I could go to the movies and possibly buy a Coke and a uh, and popcorn. Um, and the rest they took. Um, and then- oh, they took it. You didn't put it in it. a little- But can, let me back up just a second. In high school, you, did they have theater? Did they have chorus? Did they have any of that stuff? Uh, well, in my high school, we really didn't have a big theater department. Um, I actually wrote about this the other day on Facebook. Uh, my, when I was in the um, 10th grade, um, I had an A1 average in school. And because I had this A1 average, I was able to choose the electives that I wanted the following year in my junior year. So I go to the guidance counselor and I said, I want to take a drama class. And she said, Ricky, as I was called by everybody there, we don't have a drama class. And I said, well, we should have one because I'm going to go to New York to be an actor and I'm not getting any training here. And so they said, well, we'll work on this. So uh, Miss Russell uh, now. Oh, I love that you remember her name. Well, no, no. T two years ago was my 40th anniversary. Oh, well, uh, two years ago was my 40th anniversary of coming to New York. And I did a one-man show uh, celebrating that journey. And my, 
Miss Russell came to New York to see the show. Wow. Yeah. I missed she, it because I couldn't get a ticket. That's why well, I missed it. Let me explain why you didn't get a ticket. Um because you um God Did bless Richard J. Bad? God bless Richard J. Alexander. He got you a ticket to see Barbara Streisand oh, the night right. that I was doing my show. And of course you made the right decision. I would have <laughs> done the same thing. You have a good memory because I don't remember that. Yes. So that's that. So you graduated high school. Did you go on to college to study no. theater or you came no. right to New York? No, no. no. And from what I read, you had numerous jobs in this city. Oh, when you God. Moved to. Do you remember your first apartment? Where was it? Uh, 86 and 2nd Avenue. Oh, Five, that's three where my son up. lives. It was a railroad flat. It was right next to, I mean, it's a long story. We could go on for days and days and days. But the day that I arrived in New York, uh, I, um, the guy who I was going to be staying with uh, was supposed to pick me up at the airport. And he couldn't pick me up at the airport. So uh, I called him that morning and he said, take, an, um, take an, a, a taxi. Um, and my next door neighbor was a Washington, D.C. cab driver. He said, no, 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 no. These cab drivers will find out that you're green off the, uh, off the farm. They'll take you for a ride. You really have, uh, you can't do this. So Had they, you ever been to New York before? No, no, Oh, my no. God. A cute boy like you coming to New York. <laughs> so they, suggested, they suggested that I take an airport limousine, so, which was a shuttle bus. That's what they meant for it to be. I got off the airplane. Uh, and in those days, you got off the plane, you got your luggage, you walked uh, right out. Um, my eyes were so huge. Oh, I can imagine. Uh, because, I mean, I was scared to death. And I see limousines. So I go and I stand in line. And I rented $60, a stretch, black stretch <laughs> limousine. To drive to bring me into New York, so <laughs> I couldn't do it because I was feeling ostentatious or anything. It you was didn't know. I did not know. I arrived in New York City in a black stretch limousine. Oh, I love it! I so love I arrived it. at the apartment. I went up to the. Uh, we went upstairs, and um, David, who was the guy that I was going to be staying with, um, said that he was staying with a friend that night. And I had the place to myself. Now, Celeste, mind you, I had never been away from home. I had never slept in another bed except when I was at my grandparents' house. Oh, uh, my I didn't, gosh. I didn't know anyone in New York. Um, I didn't. I was afraid to leave the apartment for fear that if I left, I would be mugged my first night in New York. And there were no oh. cell phones. and There were no cell phones. Um, so he left in the refrigerator was a loaf of wheat bread and a jar of honey. That was it. And I didn't even have the knowledge or the wherewithal to order a pizza. And if I did order a pizza, I wouldn't even know how to tell them to get where I was. So I made my- Oh my God, you poor baby. My first dinner in New York was a honey sandwich uh, with- this wheat bread, <laughs> and I cried myself to sleep that oh. night. I was alone. I was. I, I allowed myself because I really carried around. I'm sorry. You were a teenager. I was a baby. I was a. I mean, I was less than a teenager. I was 18. But when you have never been anywhere, and right. you have never done anything on your own, um, you don't have life knowledge that we've developed as we go on. Um, it, Did it you really, call your mother and let her know you were there saying I called my parents. I said, I'm here in New York. And the first thing, and this is a running joke with my mom and myself. If she's watching, uh, I'm telling the truth. Um, I, I called home and the first thing my mom said was, how's the weather? <laughs> She didn't know what to say. If a she parent doesn't know about show business, it's like she didn't going know what to the to moon. Say. So, uh, you know, for years and years and years, 
Um, anytime anything major happened in my life and I'd call my mom and say, oh my God, I'm going to stay with Carol Channing. Oh my God, I just got this role. Oh my God, I just got my equity card. My How's mom the would weather? say, oh, the weather. Oh my God, I'm it, sure my... <laughs> It, you know, it, but it is but what she it was so proud of you, I'm sure. I mean, if my parents, I will tell you something. Um, I made my mind up when I was 14 that I was going to move to New York five years. I picked the date, August 5th, 1979. I was going to move to New York. And I went in and I announced it to my parents and they laughed at me. I mean, sure, you're going to go to New York. What makes you think you're going to go to New York? <clears throat> Excuse me. So every year on that day, I would say four years to go, three years to go, two years to go. And then the night before I left, my father said to me, and I say this out of respect to my dad, who I love, but my father it wasn't an easy ride with my father and myself. My father had an issue with alcohol. We were constantly fighting over that. And the night that I left, before I left, my father said, what makes you think you're gonna make it New York? And I said, you, you. If I can live through what I've lived through here, I can live through anything. Oh my! God. And I will tell you something that no matter how bad things got, I was not gonna go back. I was always going to go forward. Years later, um, I had a roommate. I went through a series of roommates for several years. Years later, I had a roommate. I was paying him cash, $500 a month on 47th Street, right across. I said, if you could walk through the back wall of Don't Tell Mama, you would walk right into my apartment. Wow. So I come home one day, and there's an eviction notice on the door. We have 72 hours to get out of the apartment. And I, when he, when my roommate came home, I was sitting on the sofa with this and he said, oh, don't worry, we've gotten lots of those. This one was serious. I was told when I called the landlord that if I didn't collect my things and get out of the apartment, everything I owned would be gone. Well, I was living out of a suitcase practically, but still, you know, I was afraid I was gonna lose everything. So I called my father and I said, I am in so much trouble. I need your help. And my father said to me, I will send you a one-way ticket to come home, but I will not support you staying in New York. And I said, fine, I'll figure it out. And I started asking around. I found what they used to call, I don't even know if they're still around anymore. They were called SROs, standing room, you know, and it was at 113th and uh, Riverside Drive. And it was with a bathroom down the hall. Um, and I had a room. Uh, my entire, the space that I'm in right now is larger than the room I was in at that time. But you know, Richard, your father gave you the greatest gift. I'm not saying it was kind. I'm not saying I would ever do that to my son. But show business requires that stick to itiveness, that passion, and that drive. So thank you, Dad. A, no, I'm sure you had to work through a lot of stuff. But I worked through a lot of stuff. And when my father died, I went home and I said to all my aunts and uncles that were sitting in that room uh, that it was the greatest gift that he ever gave me. And one of my aunts said, I can't believe that you would say something like this. I said, no. Jane Fonda says that there should be a statute of limitations on how long you hold on to the anger. I have no anger. I have no, there's none of that. Um, my father had a substance abuse problem and he dealt with it the best way he could possibly deal with it. And me being the oldest human. child, well, being the oldest, I got the brunt of a lot of it. But how many again, sisters are, wait, how I have many a sister sisters? and two brothers and I'm the oldest. And are you close with them? Have they seen your work? I'm very, very close with my sister. We talk almost every other day. Uh, uh, and my sister and I, we are actually born 13 months apart. Her birthday's coming up uh, in a few weeks. Wow. Uh, we're 13 months apart. And I used to joke that we were supposed, you know, you've heard the expression Irish twins yes. because we're so close in age. I used to joke and say that we were supposed to be uh, a, a duo act, but I prefer to work solo. So <laughs> <laughs> now, now my sister 
sister, my sister and I are very close. Uh, my brothers, I am not. My baby brother was eight years old when I left home, and oh, we so you are, don't even know him. We are we are almost complete strangers. It's oh. crazy. Yeah. But okay, so that I I'm so happy to know that information because you know you know people and you go I wonder what their childhood was like, but what was. For, what must have been frustrating is the passion you had. Thank God there were movies, honey. If there mm -hmm. weren't movies, where would you have touched that part of you? Now, mm -hmm. what about training? I mean, you have this natural, so, beautiful voice. I, well, thank you. I appreciate your saying that. The very first show and that I'm I tough. Was, well, <laughs> and again, these are stories that I tell in the show. I um, someone in my hometown told me that our local theater company was doing Mame. And I didn't know Mame from Maine, but they said there's a part in it for a 13 year old boy, go and audition. So I go to the audition. I am the first one at the theater. I was so excited. Um, they called me up on the stage and they said, so what have you prepared for us? And I said, what do you mean? What have I prepared? And they said, <laughs> I love it. they said, are you, you know, you're going to sing for us? And I said, I have to sing. Uh, and they said, this is a musical. And I said, well, I don't have anything. They said, well, can you get something? So I ran to the library. I got the Rodgers and Hammerstein songbook, which I knew was there. The, Did you've been uh, listening. Which you I've been record, listening to. I came record. back, I auditioned, and I swear to God, it was one of the worst auditions in the history of the world. I swear everything I'm telling you is the truth. It. I was so God awful. They, you know, it's like there was no way that they were going to put this kid on that stage. So they said, uh, we'll be in touch. And I left. And the words that they said, we'll be in touch, was validation that they would be in touch. <laughs> so in Hello. those days, as you said earlier, we didn't have cell phones. Um, I sat by the phone oh, for two Richard. weeks waiting for the phone call. Anytime my sister or my mom or we'd get a phone call, I'd go, get off. They're going to call me. They're going to call me. They're going to call me. Oh my for God, two, I'm sorry for laughing. No. But so for know. two weeks, I sat there waiting for this call to come in, which definitely was not coming. So I'm in school. This is a local theater company. So I'm in school. But still, let me just stop you for a second. What a naive thing to think that Somebody would be good for their word. Yes. So it's show business. It's show business. So I'm in school. <laughs> Molly Davis, who was one of the teachers' aides in school, was cast as uh, uh, as Mrs. Upson, and so she comes to me and she says, "Ricky, are you going to be at rehearsal tonight?" I said, "Rehearsal for what?" She said, "Tonight's the first night of rehearsal for Mame," and I thought. They lost my number. <laughs> Did they? They lost my number. So I went to the theater and I was oh. sitting there. I was sitting, I was sitting on the steps when <laughs> Joe Greer, who was the director, he sees me when he got out of the car. And he said, What are you doing here? And I said, Did you lose my number? <laughs> and he said, Ricky, you didn't get cast in the show. And I felt my heart just like fall. And he said, but you're here. Why don't you just stick around? So I said, okay, okay. So the show were sides. They're giving out sides to all the actors in the show. For those who don't know, sides are the specific lines for a specific character. So they're giving out the sides and there was a part in the show for a messenger. He has two lines. He comes in and he says to Agnes Gooch, sign here. And she says, oh dear, I've been here two weeks and already there've been 13 cocktail parties. And he says, only 13? So they're giving out these parts and he says, we'll just double this up. And someone said, why don't you give it to Ricky? I was there. So I said, I'll take it, I'll oh. take it. And I, those now two- how old were you? How old were you? I was 13. And your mom let you go out and to go to the theater at night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you ride your I, bicycle? Did you walk? No, no. The theater was in Conway proper, and we lived out in the suburbs. So I would, there was always some actor in the show who would give me a ride home. 
my parents, once again, and this sounds terrible about my parents, and I don't mean it to be. These are the facts of what happened. So those two lines, I said over and over and over again. <laughs> you thought that I was rehearsing a monologue for Hamlet. For Hamlet. <laughs> and, but I, I showed up at every rehearsal. I was you there. I so much. I ended up being in some of the other musical numbers. Uh, it's today. Open a new window. Uh, you know, uh, the other, the big numbers. Mame. Um, I ended up being in those numbers. So my, I found out that my parents came to see the show. You know, this was community theater. We did three shows. I found out two weeks after the show closed that my parents had come because I found the program stuffed under the cushion of the sofa. That's how I found out. They never said anything. But they about said anything. Mm -mm, did mm -mm. you ever ask later? Of course I did. I mean, what they, did they say nothing. What could they say? I mean, oh, it was poor dear. I they did the not a connect with it. If you need them. So the next show that I auditioned for uh, was I didn't audition for like two years. They were doing the unsinkable Molly Brown, and I knew that Molly Brown, in my research, had two younger brothers. So I went in to audition for this. And they said, well, we want you to read for a couple of things. So I read for Roberts the Butler. And even though I was 17 years old, community theater, right. they cast me as Roberts. I had a real role in the show. And opening at night, there was a woman in my hometown, Florence Epps. I'm going to show you this because her picture is, this was Florence Epps at the Pasadena Playhouse. Oh my God. She came back to my hometown. What year to, was that? This is 1977 uh, that I did this. So she had come back to my hometown to teach and she came backstage and I hear, she had this very high reedy voice. She was very much like Natalie Schaefer. Uh, you know, from uh, Gilligan's Island. Right. And she's making her way down the hall and she's going, where's Ricky Skipper? Where's Ricky Skipper? And I'm thinking, oh my God, they're kicking me out of the theater. <laughs> and she, so came back, she came backstage and she handed me a red apple. And she said, do you know why I'm giving you this apple? And I said, I have no idea. She said, I want you to go to the library and I want you to check out the book the Royal Family of Broadway about the Barrymores. And when you get to the part about the apples, I want you to call me. So of course, the next day I went to the library, I got the book and it turns out that on Ethel Barrymore's opening night, her brothers gave her a basket of apples. So if the show was a flop, she wouldn't starve to death. Oh, so That became a tradition and every opening night, um, uh, every opening night, they would give each other apples. And if you ever went to Barrymore's, the restaurant in the city, there was an apple on the door. The apple, the apple award is the Barrymore award. It's a little golden apple. So I called her up and she said, I think you have the makings of being a great actor, but only if you get rid of that accent. Because if you don't get rid of the accent, you're going to be doing Tobacco Road the rest of your life. Wait, show, and, tell us the accent. Show us the accent. Well, I had an accent you could cut with a knife. When I talked, it sounded just like this. And, uh, you know, you, uh, when uh, a Southern accent, you drop off the last letters of the words. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's no G's in anything. Uh, anything. Everything just drops off. And you can't understand a lot of what we say. Um, and how, how did you fix that? So... Um, she said that she would like to teach me elocution. And I said, uh, Miss Epps, if I say to my parents, Epps. yeah, if I say to my parents that I want to take elocution lessons, they're going to laugh at me. They're going to shoot me. <laughs> you know, so she said, we'll work something out. She had a little playhouse in her backyard. And every Wednesday and Thursday afternoon, I would go to her house and she would, we would read from the classics. Uh, she would uh, ask, and let's say that I'm reading a biography. And then she, we would read them out loud to help me with my elocution. And she would say, just throw me a name. Just throw me any famous name. Oh, me. I'm yes. Yeah. Throw Carol me a Chan. Carol, Carol Channing at that time. 
tell me three things that Carol Channing is known for. Her and voice. If I couldn't, oh, well, if oh, I could answer that question, she would say, um, yeah. she would close the book and she would say, I will see you next Wednesday. Know who Carol Channing is. Oh. And then I would go, I would rush to the library. I would go to the little theater section in Conway, South Carolina, oh, and I, I would go it. through all the theater books and I would look in the back of the books. And if Carol Channing's name was there, I would check out the book. And so one time my parents came to get me from the library. I had 36 books to check out. And the librarian let me check them out because she knew my sister will vouch for this because I had a laundry basket full of books that all had this celebrity's name in the back of the book. So she instilled in me, Miss Epps, that research, uh, research before Google, uh, I knew who these celebrities are. And this is part of, you know, I think now of what I'm doing now, of the love and the research that I put into each person. I want to know who these people are. But she instilled in me that every time I stepped on stage, now every time I step in front of a camera, I am carrying on my uh, shoulders the mantle of every person that's ever come before me. And it's up to me to celebrate them. And this is what she instilled in me. This photograph that I showed you, uh, years later, um, I'm, you know, I go home and Miss Epps had passed away and her house was being sold. And I called my sister and I said, I really want to go and look at the house. I want to walk through the house again. I want to share those memories again. And we went and there was a box in this playhouse. And I asked if I could take the box. And the realtor said, no, that comes with the house. And I said, this is all going to be thrown out. No one's going to appreciate this. And she said, it belongs to the house. I can't give you anything. I stole that picture. And it hangs over my desk so that I see Miss Epps. Oh, what day. a great um, story. But well, um, Bravo. That oh, is the great. only thing I've ever stolen in my life. I stole that picture. Richard, all I can say, first of all, that's a great story. But the lessons that you learned from your small town, from your yes. father, from this teacher, that was a mentor. Mm -hmm. and oh, of she was a mentor. I mean, oh I, Miss Epps believed in me. Um, I had two aunts, uh, Aunt Mary and Aunt Christine, and they knew that I was taking these lessons with her because I told everybody within earshot. And they ran into her at the bank. And my mind was already made up. I was coming to New York. I was going to come after I graduated. And they said to Miss Epps, you need to talk him out of this because he is not prepared for New York. He's going to die up there. He's going to be swallowed up there. And Miss Epps said he has to do this. He has to leave Conway. And Miss Epps so, told him. Yes. On August 5th, 1979, you got on a plane and you came to New York. Your first meal was. <laughs> this was part of my show. Money. I flew in on Piedmont Airlines. <laughs> That must have been a prop from your show, honey. This is a prop from my show. A one way ticket. Um, and this was the other thing. I mean, um, I called Piedmont, Piedmont Airlines. Oh, doesn't even exist anymore. exist anymore. The only airline that flew direct from Myrtle Beach to New York. And I called them up because I didn't have a credit card or anything. And they said, well, you can come and pick up a ticket at the counter. And a one-way ticket was $86. And so I went to, I, I that called. That was a lot of money. That was a lot of money. That was out of the $500 that I was saving. So I went to my dad and I said, I need to get to the airport. I need uh, to buy. Well, the airport was part of the Air Force Base. I said, I need to get to the Air Force Base. I need to get a ticket. And my dad said, we're not playing this game. And I said, well, I'll get there myself. So I hitchhiked. I went out. I put my thumb out. A car pulled up. I was an 18-year-old boy. It's a different time. This is 1979. Right. This car pulls up. This woman says, where are you going? And I said, to the airport. And she said, well, I'm heading to Myrtle Beach. I can drive you there. So this woman gave me a lift. I bought my one-way ticket. I came back. I told my parents, I'm going to New York. And I was so, so excited. And again, everybody around me, with very few exceptions, were like, you'll be back. You'll be back. No, you no. won't. 
I won't. I did it. I did it. That's and it's all. It's a. It's all true. Now, wow! <laughs> I can hear stories about that. I love that. I love the accent. We'll do a whole series. <laughs> so, okay. So you get to New York. You're really not trained except for this woman. You don't know New York. You don't have an agent. What then ensued? Well, when I was in South Carolina, um, anytime a theater group or something would come and do an assembly at our school, as we called them. Oh, you were uh, a hustler my, even then, weren't you, baby? My teachers, because I was an A1 student, would let me out of class to go see the shows. And I would go backstage and I would say, I'm going to New York when I graduate from high school. Yeah. Yes, and I want to know, who should I study with? Well, I kept writing down all the names of the people that they were telling me. Oh, and the, Richard. The one name that kept popping up more than anybody was Stephen Strimpel. I don't know if that name rings any bells with you or anything. Look, from a long and so yes. Yes, he was an he was the top teacher, but he was teaching at HB Studios. Oh, HB, so I, HB. So I came to New York, <laughs> and I, you know, and I go to HB. I, I arrived on a Sunday. On Monday, I got a job. Uh, I doing, got a job doing. Uh, I was uh, a messenger on Wall Street, fifty-five Water Street. My first six dollars an hour as a messenger. How did you get that? Out of the Village Voice. Oh, the I, village yeah. voice. Oh, my the God. Village voice. Remember the back? It had all the jobs. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. And I went through and I circled everything that said no experience necessary. So because I didn't. <laughs> I, I was I was out of high school. So and I walk in and I said, I just got off the plane yesterday. I just got here. I don't know what exactly you're looking for, but I, I'm good. <laughs> and I got the job. So then on the following Saturday. Wait, no, um, you got to stay on the messenger just a little longer. Okay. okay. What did you message? What, what, how it, did that was, work? It was, it was documents that were, they were, you know, they were highly class classified oh, documents. It was in the Wall Street area. I, I don't know what I was, I could have been smuggling drugs. Or all I know. Were you walking? No, uh, mostly walking. Uh, if it was too far away, they would have a car to drive us there. And I would, all I, all I would have to do is go in, they would sign some papers, give them back to me. I had this big black suitcase type of thing that they gave me. And then I would go back and they would give me another assignment. And I would do like seven of those each day. Uh, but it gave me a chance to really learn the Wall Street area. Yeah. So following Saturday, I go to HB Studios and I said, I'd like to study with Stephen Strimpel. And they said, there's a long waiting list. Um, so we could probably uh, sign you up for six months from now. And I said, no, I want to start right away. So then they suggested that I study with Barbara Coggan. And again, I don't know if that name rings any bells with you. I sign up for, I swear this is a true story. I sign up for Barbara Coggan's uh, scene development class. And the night before I was supposed to start classes, she died. She was on Broadway in Gemini. She died. So here I am, my first teacher <laughs> that I'm signing up for dies. So um, so then they suggested Michael Beckett. Oh, and so wow. I signed up for Michael Beckett's class. The first scene that he assigned me was from The Dutchman. And The Dutchman by Leroy Jones is about an African-American man and a Jewish woman who she, who's pregnant who meet on the subway. Now you tell me which one of those roles I'm right for. <laughs> but he said, I know you're not right for this, but I just want to see what you do with a scene. So I went off and with my scene partner, we worked on the scene. We came back the following week, we did the scene and he sat in his chair stroking his mustache the whole time. And he says, I really haven't seen the two of you work together before. So I'm going to give you another scene. Come back next week and we'll do the next scene. So he assigned a scene from A Taste of Honey. So we come back the next week and he's sitting there stroking his mustache the whole time. And he never gave me a note. And he said, I want to see how your character will develop with this. So I want you to do the following scene also in A Taste of Honey. So I go back 
And I work on the scene with her. And I said, I'm telling you, if he says, have I seen the two of you work together before? I'm not going to be responsible for my actions. And she's like, Richard, please don't do this. Please don't do it. And I said, so sure enough, we go back and I sit up there. I'm doing the scene and I'm getting angrier and angrier as I'm doing the scene because he's sitting there stroking his mustache. Stro we finish the scene. Celeste, he says, have I seen the two of you work together before? <laughs> I said, that's it. I've had it. I don't know how things are done here in New York, but when I go into an audition, they don't care whether they've seen me before or not. They only want to know if I can deliver the goods. And when I go to the theater, I don't care whether I've seen that actor before or not. I just want to know that they can play the character that they're playing. I've done three scenes in this class and you haven't given me one note. And each week I come back and I hear, have I seen the two of you? Oh my God. What and the say? whole class, the whole class is screaming because they're applauding me. And I stormed out. And I hate to say this because you're a great teacher. I never took another acting class again as long as I lived. Wow. I mean, I signed up for a commercial class years later, and I'm in the class, and I worked on the scene. I kept calling my scene partner, who was too busy. I mean, I did. One of the greatest. I have to just make a comment, Richard. I studied there also. Oh, I shouldn't say. Anyway, it was not all. It was also hundred years ago. Not the greatest experience for me there either. It mm -hmm. was. I don't know why. Some people love it. Some people don't. Right, but I will tell you that I did do. Um, I did a workshop. Trent Goff again. I don't know if that name rings. No, he had a doesn't. full page ad on the back of Backstage and Leo Scholl's show business for the script development workshop. And I went in and I signed up. This was geared at playwrights. But what they did is they had a pool of actors and these actors were assigned scenes each week or plays to read so they could hear their plays out loud. And I don't know if it was my age or what it was, but at the time of the script development workshop, I was working on a different show every week. And during the early 80s, I would say I got my first stock job in 1983, but I did a lot of showcases in New York. There was a time they where were you could- big then in the 80s. They were big until, dare I say it, Reaganomics yes. cleared out funding for the arts. I mean, there were shows in storefront windows. There were shows in lofts. There were shows in everything. And was I making money? No. But I, it, there, was, there were very few periods throughout the 80s when I was not on a stage. If I was not on a stage, there I was- There was always opportunity. You're right. And I, I was- I want to skip ahead because we don't have that much time. Yes. There was a big chunk of your career that is now, I know you have left that, but- was important to a lot of people, gave a lot of people tons of enjoyment. Mm -hmm. You honored one of the greats. Um, tell us a little bit about that period, the Carol Channing period. Here she is. Yeah. My girlfriend. Um, I, a book, I understand. I'm is sorry? True? A book is coming out? I'm working on a book celebrating all the women who have played Dolly. Uh, and uh, I hope that the book comes out in four years to celebrate the 60th anniversary of Dolly happening on Broadway. Uh, but with Carol, and again, we don't have a lot of time, but I, I would mimic people that I saw on television and I got up and I would perform in piano bars. And when Houston All Red, who used to play at the, uh, uh, at the piano bar at 67 the Broadway, he discovered me uh, that I could perform as Carol Channing. So over the course of several years, opportunities would pop up for me at a party or something to perform as Carol Channing. And then in 1990- Well, stay at, wait, 1990, but you were on 67th Street and it was called- The Piano Bar. The Piano Bar and Sweetwaters was across the street on That's Amsterdam. Right. That's right. Wow. Okay. So I remember it because I lived on 67. Yes. Okay. 1994. Hello, Dolly comes to Broadway. 
It's Carol Channing's last revival of Dolly. And a friend of mine uh, calls me up and he said, you should do a show about Carol Channing. And I said, if I do this show and uh, what if audiences don't like me? I wish that I could take some of these pictures off the wall and show them to you. But they uh, said, uh, I mean, Glenn Charlo is watching here and he could possibly post uh, some of these pictures up. But I started putting together a show about Carol Channing. And then as fate would have it, I got the opportunity to perform the show for Carol Channing before I opened it. And the night that I went in to perform wow. for her, I said, if she doesn't like what I'm doing, I will never do it again. I had nothing vested in it. So it would have been an easy thing for me to say, well, that was a little novelty that I could do. But again, this is who I am. I do not want to make fun of the subject that I'm performing as. So I got the chance to perform for Carol. Thank God she loved what I was doing. She gave me her endorsement with it. She gave me one of the greatest quotes that I used for years in all of my promotion. She said, it was not a tribute. It was a Valentine. It was the first time that she had been shown with love, respect, and polish. and that was in all my promos and everything. Um, and I did that for 20 years. The best thing that came out of all that, above everything else, bookings, I got my equity card because I was playing Carol Janning. I headlined in Atlantic City, Las Vegas. I performed on a cruise ship to Greece. I, all those incredible things. The greatest gift was her friendship. The fact that we became friends, the fact that I stayed at her home in Palm Springs, the fact that I remember, you know, calling me on all the holidays, talking, one day calling me up saying, you know, Richard, I woke up this morning and I realized I don't know how to fry an egg. Can you teach me how to fry an egg? <laughs> I mean, the, the calls that I would get from her, she had this light force that was just so incredible. And I was very, very fortunate that I got a chance to see her without the wigs, without the lashes, without everything. And the closer I got to her, the lesser I wanted to perform as her. Because- oh, Isn't that interesting? Because I never felt that I could live up to that. But every time I would say, I'm not gonna do this anymore, something would pull me back in. And then Harry died. <laughs> Harry was her husband. Let and me ask you a question before you go to Harry. N knowing her as a friend, as a being, versus the icon that she was, what was that twist off that made you say, I, this doesn't feel as good as it used to? Well, you know, it, it, it's funny. And our, uh, I mean, your friend, she's not a, a mutual friend, but I love and adore her, Kristen, uh, performed at her memorial. I was invited to be out there. She sang Smile and was just with images of Carol behind her. It was just so beautiful and moving. Uh, but Kristen's I, good at that. I remember sitting on the sofa in Palm Springs talking to Carol. And I said, it must seem odd to you that I perform as you on stage. And she said something to me. And I've got the poster here. I can show it to you. She said, you are a great musical comedy star, but nobody will ever know it because you're hiding behind me. I love what you're doing. I respect what you're doing. You're really good at this. And you found your niche. I found my niche. And one incredible moment that I had, and again, Glenn was there that night, the American Theater Wing honored Carol Channing, Tommy Toon, and James Earl Jones. And Bob Kalele, who was producing that event, found me through YouTube. And I mean, I've taken a lot of those clips down because I want to put that behind me and move forward. But he- you really do then if you- yes. But those clips were there. And he called me up and he says, I'd like to, when are you performing again? And the Sheet Music Society, um, I was going to be doing my show for them uh, on, and I'll never, it was April 14th. And I said, the lighting is not great. The sound will not be great. Um, it will not be in the best circumstances. But come and see what I'm doing, and you'll get a sense of what I do. 
he came and then afterwards he invited Danny, my husband and I back to his apartment. And he said, I wanted you to come on and do a number. He said, I changed my mind. And I thought, okay. He said, I want you to close the show. He oh. said, he said, um, can you do 15 minutes for us? They paid for my band. I had a five piece band. I had three backup singers. They paid for everything. And in all the programs, at the table where Carol was sitting, Carol was there because she was being honored. They took out the section of the programs announcing that I was going to be in the show. So she had no idea until I walked out on stage. And Bob Kaleli said to me, and this was the greatest compliment. He said that I'm on stage performing and Carol grabbed him and said, am I really that good? Oh my. Can you believe this, Carol Janney? Yeah, no, I can't believe it. And what the other thing that's striking me so profoundly is you come on week after week after week celebrating all these people, writers, performers, directors, musical directors, and your performance history is so rich. One does mm. not have to be famous to have had a beautiful time in show business. Mm -hmm. And you certainly have walked a very lovely path. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate wow. your taking that. No, it was you great. Um, so, you know, and then um, we, in the last years of her life, she was in failing health. So we didn't speak with each other. We didn't talk with each other. And when she passed away uh, and I got the invitation and it was invitation only uh, to come to Palm Springs for her memorial. I felt, you know, this was so wonderful that I would be there and that, you know, it was, it was complete closure for me um, because a lot had happened, which we cannot and will not talk about, uh, but things happen in life and uh, it was, it was time to move on. And, you know, so that aspect of my life, was, as you say, a very rich part of my tapestry, but it was time to move on. And, and this, God bless you for knowing that. Mm -hmm. it, it, organically, we kind of sometimes in this business, we want to stick it out just a little bit longer. You knew. I know we don't have a lot of time. Tell me what's, first of all, wow, I love that. I didn't have to do much. You're a really good <laughs> <laughs> And well, tell me you. what, so what's next now, Richard? What do you want to do? COVID, I mean, we all have lived through that, but what you have, hopefully we've lived through that. It's been such a horrible year, but you've thrived. You've Well, I, I will tell and... you, I, uh, when I started doing this last March, it's been over a year now, uh, when I started doing these, um, I never thought that it would take off the way it has. Um, I, you know, and it's very funny, you know, and I'll show you this very quickly. Um, here on my desk, these are my intentions for 2021. And one of my intentions, uh, you know, was to uh, create this. I am working now. One of my goals, so anyone who's watching, uh, my goal is that, that by the end of this year, I will have 2,021 subscribers on YouTube. I'm not shooting for 10,000. I'm shooting for 2021 because this is 2021. So how that's have, how many do you have now? Um, I am uh, I, I'm at 800 and uh, wow. not, uh, not, but a lot of them I've gotten in the last few months. My goal and my intention, and it's funny because I want to give a shout out to Chuck Pennington, who is my assistant, Glenn Charlo, um, Lisa Ajini uh, Martinez. These are all people who are part of my support team and they are there. They support me. They hold me up. Uh, they keep me going. Uh, Chuck uh, does these incredible montages of these celebrities. Um, there are a lot of people out there who are doing interviews. Some of them are better than I am. Some are worse than I am. Uh, some are trying to get their feet in the door. Everybody has their own path that they're on. Just like voice teachers. Just like voice teachers. <laughs> my goal, my dream, my intention is to stay in my lane, keep my blinders on, and be the best Richard Skipper that I can possibly be.
And so if you could see what my desk looks like with the books that are piled up, I research these people. Miss Epps, thank you for the things that she taught me, you know, and, you know, and people go, I don't know how you do this. Well, I'm going to give you my secret. I treat my day like I am in high school again. And this hour is devoted to this person. And then the next hour is devoted to the next person. And I really, so when I sit down to talk to someone, I know who I'm talking to. I know where they've been, what they're doing, and hopefully what's coming up. And those things that we don't know, because I'm not gossipy, I'm not interested in salacious details of their lives. I'm not interested in what other people have said or have not said about them. I'm interested in their journey and the path that they're on. So in answer to your question, my real goal with everything that I'm doing, I want to be the go-to person in this business. If you want your story to be told, uh, that's above board and that is ce celebratory instead of um, uh, digging into the crevices of your life uh, because we all have them. We all have them. The dish. Um, yes. I'm not interested in the dish. And I was interviewing someone a few weeks ago and a friend of his wrote to me and said, at first I'm thinking, why isn't he talking about this show he did on Broadway? Why isn't he talking about the Tony nomination that he got? Why isn't he talking about this? But he says, as I sat and listened to you, I learned things about him that I didn't know. And we've been friends for 25 years. That's my goal. Last well, night- Richard, I got off our interview and I was like, oh, I didn't tell him I was in this show and I didn't do, tell him I didn't do this. And and I, But we didn't talk about the shows. We talked about the being. And that's what I got today from you. I really feel like I met you for the first time today. I love <laughs> your stories. And well, I'll be front thank and you. Center next time well, I, I have, you. you know, when, uh, you know, someone asked me, and this is my own personal thing. I know that our clubs are opening. I saw in the news last night, Jerry Seinfeld was at the Gotham Comedy Club. Yeah. Um, and he's performing at everything again. For me personally, it's still too soon. Uh, I there's, agree. There's just so much that we don't know right now. And I've been thinking when I don't have to wear a mask, because when I'm sitting in the audience, I want that person on stage to know what my face looks like. Uh, you know, I I don't want to be sitting in a venue wearing a mask. That being said, if I'm out in public, I'm wearing a mask. Um, but I don't want to have to go to the theater or anything wearing a mask. And I was thinking about this the other day. And for me, and this is my own personal choice, I will continue to do what I'm doing right here. I will continue to meet in, I've got three friends that are coming for dinner tomorrow night. Uh, we don't have a lot of guests in our home, uh, but we've all been vaccinated. My second is coming up, but I'm at home all the time. I don't go anywhere. Uh, we but, never talked about how you got to Piermont from New York City. Well, we'll end on that note because we I see the clock running out and I, and I wanna be respectful of your time and everyone else's. I met Danny. You know, and uh, oh. you know, and that first night we were together, and he and I said, "Where do you live?" And he said, "Rockland County," and I said, "Where's that?" <laughs> <laughs> and we are going, you know, uh, thirty-one years. You know, we're going on thirty-two. God bless. And uh, so I never in a million years uh, would have thought that I would be here. Um, I'm going to say a few of the closing remarks that I say. And then I'm going to give you the final word to wrap this all up. I want to let everyone know, have, have a wonderful, happy Easter or whatever it is that you celebrate. Um, I, like everyone else, am taking tomorrow off. So there will be no shows. But I will be back on Monday night and I will be interviewing Wayne Smith. Uh, he is a share impersonator. Interestingly enough, I saw him on stage in the 80s at Bally's and Atlantic City as Cher. Oh my. And I saw that show and I thought, wow, that's where I want to be. And I ended up in Atlantic City. I did um, three long running shows in Atlantic City. So I'm going to have him on, on uh, Monday night at five o'clock. Please join us if you can. Um, I also end every show personally 
by asking everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list and the third name that pops up today, reach out to that person and let them know what they mean to you. Not a phone call, not a, uh, not a text message, not an email, not a private inbox message, a phone call. Pick up the phone. As our dear friend David Friedman says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And you never know what someone else is going through right now. And Celeste, it means so much to me that when you said, somebody should interview you. And I said, well, why don't you do it? And you said, I will. And we picked this date immediately. We made it happen. That's the way I live my life. Uh, when opportunities are presented, I grab them. I always have. Anyone who knows me. Um, and I just turned 60 years old or 60 <laughs> years young. You're a baby. <laughs> no, but this is, I want to say something about this. I am just going to throw caution to the wind. I don't believe that I have 60 more years on this planet. That being said, I, you know, our community just lost Rick Jensen, who I'm sure you oh. knew as well. Uh, devastating. Uh, in the prime of his life, uh, he had projects. He a musician, yeah. Yes, he had projects coming up and everything. None of us know what tomorrow holds. And especially, if nothing else, that's what this past year should have told us. And yeah. so if something in your life means something to you and you want to go after it and you want to grab it or something, um, there are going to be people who are going to say yes or no. All of life boils down to that choice. Um, and I'm going to say one thing and then I'm going to shut up. Um, when I interviewed Carol Lawrence, she said, being in this business is the greatest elixir in the world. The more you get, the more you want. The rub, however, is whether or not other people want it. And my hope is that you want what I have to offer and that I will continue to do as long as there's an audience paying attention to what I have to do and say, by all means, you know, do so. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. And yes, now we want to, to we want 2021 by the end of 2021. Right. And I'm right. just going to end with this. Turning tables today on you was my pleasure. God uh, bless you. I hope to see you, you soon. You Bye, will. everybody. Thanks Happy for having Easter. me, Richard. Goodbye. I love you. Ciao. Bye. Bye. You too. Thank you. Bye. -bye.